Hi, welcome. Grandma Honey here, and I have another story for you. This one's called Bonnie's Big Day, and it's written by James Harriet, who had a career as a vet in Yorkshire, England. So this is one of his stories. And this one is illustrated by Ruth Brown. All right, let's get started. One sunny morning in early September, I drove to see old John Skipton at Dale Close Farm since he had telephoned to say that one of his cart horses was lame. As I got out of the car, the untidily dressed figure of a farmer came through the kitchen door of Dale Close. John always seemed to look like a scarecrow. And today was no different. He was wearing a tattered buttonless coat, which was tied around his waist with string. His trousers were much too short. And as he hurried towards me, I could see that he was wearing socks of different colors. One was red and the other was blue. By working very hard when he was a young man, Mr. Skipton had saved enough money to buy his own farm with its handsome stone house. He had never married, and because he was always so busy looking after the sheep or the cows on the hill or bringing in the harvest from the fields or picking the apples in the orchard, he had been much too busy to worry about himself, which is why he was always dressed in such very old clothes. The horses are down by the river he said in his usual gruff manner. We'll have to go down there. And he seized a pitchfork and stabbed it into a pile of hay, which he then hoisted onto his shoulder. I pulled my large Gladstone bag from the car and set off behind him. It was difficult to keep up with the farmer's brisk pace, even though he must have been 50 years older than me. And I was glad when we reached the bottom of the hill because the bag was heavy and I was getting rather hot. I saw the two horses standing in the shallows of the Pebbly River. They were nose to tail and were rubbing their chins gently on each other's backs. Beyond them, a carpet of green turf ran up to a high sheltered ridge, while all around clumps of oak and beech blazed in the autumn sunshine. Wow, they're in a nice place, Mr. Skipton, I said. Aye, and they can keep cool in the hot weather, and they've got a barn when the winter comes. At the sound of his voice, the two big horses came trotting up from the river, the gray one first, and the chestnut following a little more slowly and limping slightly. Ah, oh, they were fine big heart cart horses, but I could see that they were old and the sprinkling of white hairs were on their faces. But despite their age, however, they pranced around old John, stamping their enormous feet and throwing their heads about and pushing the farmer's cap over his eyes with their muzzles. Oh, get over, leave off, he cried. He pulled at the gray horse's forelock. This is Bonnie. She's well over 20 years old. And then he ran his hand down the front leg of the chestnut. And this is Dolly. She's nearly 30 now and not one day sickness until now. When did they last do any work, I asked. Oh, about 12 years ago, I reckon, the farmer replied. I stared at him in amazement. Twelve years? Have they been down here all this time? Aye, just playing about down here. They've earned their retirement. And for a few seconds, he stood silent. His shoulders were hunched, hands deep in the pockets of a tattered coat. They worked very hard when I had to struggle to get this farm going, he murmured. 
and I knew he was thinking of the long years those horses had pulled the plow, had drawn the hay and harvest wagons, and had done all the hard work which tractors do now. I noticed that Dolly was a bit lame when I came down with their hay yesterday, he said. Luckily, I come down each day. You mean you climb down the hillside every single day, I asked? Aye, rain, wind, or snow. They look forward to me bringing a few oats or some good hay. I examined Dolly's foot and I found an old nail embedded deep in the soft part of her foot. And I was able to pull it out quite easily with a pair of pinchers. And then I gave her an anti-tetanus injection to eliminate any risk of later infection. Climbing back up the hill, I couldn't help thinking how wonderful it was that old John had made the long journey to see the horses in all weathers every day for 12 years. Oh, he certainly loved those great animals. And a thought struck me, and I turned to him. You know, Mr. Skipton, it's the Derby show next Saturday. You should enter the mares and the family pets class. I know that they're asking for unusual entries this year, but perhaps you should only take Bonnie since Dolly's foot will be a bit sore for a few days. The farmer frowned. What on earth are you talking about? Go on, I said. Take Bonnie to the show. Those horses are your pets, aren't they? Pets, he snorted. You couldn't call one of those big clodhoppers a pet. I never heard of anything so silly. And when he got back to the farmyard, he thanked me gruffly, gave me a nod, and disappeared into the house. The following Saturday, it was my duty to attend the Derby show as the vet in charge. I had spent a pleasant time strolling around the showground, looking at the pens of cattle and sheep, the children's ponies, the massive bulls, and the sheepdog trials in the neighboring fields. And then over the loudspeaker came the following announcement. With the entrance for the family pets class, please take their places in the ring. I was always interested in this event, so I walked over and stood by the secretary, who was sitting at a table near the edge of the ring. He was Derby's local bank manager, a prim little man with rimless spectacles and a pork pie hat. I could see that he was pleased at the number of entrants that were now filing into the ring. He looked at me and beamed. They've certainly taken me at my word when I asked for unusual entries this year. The parade was led by a fine white nanny goat, which was followed by a pink piglet. And apart from numerous cats and dogs of all shapes and sizes, there was a goldfish in its bowl and at least five rabbits. There was a parrot on a perch and some budgies that were having an outing in their cage. And then to an excited buzz of conversation, a man walked into the ring with a hooded falcon on his wrist. Splendid, splendid, cried Mr. Secretary. But then his mouth fell open and everyone stopped talking as the most unexpected sight appeared. Old John Skipton came striding into the ring and he was leading Bonnie. <laughs> but it was quite a different man and horse than I had seen a few days before. John still wore the same old tattered coat tied with a string but today I noticed that both his socks were the same color and on his head perched right in the center was an ancient bowler hat. It made him look almost smart, but not as smart as Bonnie. She was dressed in a full show regalia of an old fashioned cart horse. Her hooves were polished and oiled. The long feathery hair on her lower limbs had been washed and fluffed out. Her mane, tail, and forelock had been plated with green and yellow ribbons, and her coat had been groomed until it shone in the sunshine. 
She was wearing part of a harness from her working days, and it too had been polished, and little bells hung from the collar. It quite took my breath away to look at her. Mr. Skipton, Mr. Skipton, you can't bring that great thing in here. This is the class of family pets, cried Mr. Secretary, leaping up from his chair. Bonnie is my pet, responded the farmer. She's part of my family, just like that old goat over there. Well, I disagree, said Mr. Secretary, waving his arms. You must take her out of the ring and go home. Old John Skipton put on a fierce face and glared at the man. Bonnie is my pet, he repeated. Just ask Mr. Harriet. I shrugged my shoulders. Perfectly true. This mare hasn't worked for over 12 years and is kept entirely for Mr. Skipton's pleasure. I'd certainly call Bonnie a pet. But, but, sputtered Mr. Secretary. But then he sat down suddenly on his chair and he sighed. Oh, very well then. Go and get into line. So John turned and led Bonnie to a place right in the middle of the other competitors. On one side of them was a little pink piglet and on the other side, a tortoise. It was a most curious sight. The task of judging the pets had been given to the district nurse, who was very sensibly dressed in her official uniform to give her an air of authority. Judging this class was always difficult, and when she looked along the line and kept seeing the great horse, she knew it was going to be very difficult indeed. She looked carefully at every competitor, but her eyes always came back to Bonnie. Oh, all the rabbits were very sweet. The falcon was impressive. The dogs were charming. And the piglet was cute. But Bonnie was magnificent. First prize to Mr. Skipton and Bonnie, she announced, and everyone cheered. As the rosette was presented, a man came to take a photograph for the local newspaper. It looked as though the great horse knew all about her prize as she posed there, dignified and beautiful. John too stood very erect and proud, <laughs> but unfortunately every time the photographer clicked the camera, Bonnie pushed the bowler hat over the farmer's eyes. <laughs> it was the mare's way of showing her love but I couldn't help wondering how the picture would come out. After the show, I went back to Dale Close to help John undress Bonnie, and I went with them down the hill to the field by the river. As we approached, Dolly came trotting up from the river, winning with pleasure to see her friend and companion again. Her foot is quite healed now, I said, noting the horse's even stride. And in the gentle evening light, we watched the two old horses hurrying towards each other. And then for a long time, they stood rubbing their faces together. Oh, look at that, said old John with one of his rare smiles. Bonnie is telling Dolly all about her big day. And here's the picture. Bonnie takes first prize in the family pets class. <laughs> As she pushes over his bowler. That's so cute. And that's our story for today. Bonnie's big day. Bye-bye for now. Be blessed. <laughs>